will start. Okay. So it's our great pleasure to have uh, Professor Ranjan Laha from Indonesia Science Bangalore uh, as our speaker today. So Ranjan, like uh, many of our uh, speakers, is an alumnus of uh, uh, their Spell Presidency College Physics Department. Uh, so he did his BSc from 2003 to 2006, and then he went to IIT as an integrated uh, PhD student. And uh, but he left uh, after three years and then uh, went on to Ohio State University uh, Physics Department as a PhD student and finished his PhD in 2014. Then he was a postdoc at Stanford and uh, then uh, did a one and a half year stint of postdocs at the uh, University of Mainz in Germany and then again to CERN. And then from there, he came back and joined IIT as a faculty member in uh, 2020. And uh, so uh, you will hear about his work, so I'll not get into that. Um, so he's a proof that even if you leave IIT, you integrate a PhD program in the middle of it, they don't uh, dislike you. <laughs> they hire you back and make you the chair of the PhD program. <laughs> that, that's the Coco convener. That's the way to that's the way to do <laughs> delinquents. Um, and uh, I think I, I there's always one story that needs to be said. So uh, I think the story that I uh, quickly uh, off the top of my head remember about Ranjan is so Ranjan in 2017-ish wrote to us uh, uh, both Estinam and me uh, about giving a colloquium at presidency. And uh, I think he was one of the first person who he had no contact with before, who contacted us for giving a colloquium. So that was sort of the sort of a benchmark for the presidency physics colloquium at the time, because there were many colloquiums before that, as you know, there were colloquiums from 2013. But uh, someone who we did not know at all, other than the fact that I mean he is a presidency alumna. So he was probably the first speaker like that. Nowadays, we get about one uh, one email every week about giving a collection, <laughs> which I mean, we are happy uh, to get some of it. Yeah. Most of that. It's a very uh, pleasure and a privilege. And it's great to see that uh, that Ranjan is now uh, in India as a faculty member at a at an esteemed institution. Um, so. With that, we'll I'll keep the mic. So you don't need it. Uh, okay, you will need the mic or which mic will work? Yeah. So we can. I have kept it in whichever direction you want. So standing there and talk is probably difficult, but uh, if you want to do that, you can do that. Or I mean, the point is that the sound recording becomes bad as you go further. Yeah, yeah, the that's laptop. for sure. That's right. The so, sound recording is happening through this or laptop? Laptop. In the laptop, but when you speak in the mic, the laptop catches very well. Very well. Okay. Hello. Hello. The Palta is what? It should work now. Yes, it's fine. And then it just can. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. All right. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to deliver this talk. Uh, yeah. Uh, and I, I would also like to thank all of you for coming here and listening to my talk. Uh, I'll be, it's always a pleasure to be back at presidency. Uh, lots of nice fond memories. Uh, so I'll be talking about uh, a very broad topic. Uh, detecting low mass primordial black holes as the dark matter can do it, right? And I'll try to define what is low mass, what is primordial black hole, things like that. So obviously this work is not done uh, by me on my own, uh, on my own. So there are lots of collaborators who have taught me all of these things. So, so currently in physics, we are uh, at a very privileged scenario, right? Because among the entire history of humanity, we can now answer the question, what is the universe made up of? If you think about it, uh, even Newton could not have answered that question. 
right? We can answer the question. And that is a privileged position. But that also gives you more responsibility actually to answer what exactly are the things that we have not yet discovered. How can we discover it, right? So dark matter is one such thing, right? And the question becomes, what is dark matter? So let me start with an, yeah, with an obligatory slide. So if you probe the universe at length scales, say beyond a few kiloparsecs and, and larger length scales, you will find that you require something like dark matter to explain all the observations in the universe, right? So, so I know that almost all of you or many of you know what is dark matter. So let me go through this slide a bit faster. So if you look at a galaxy and you look at the rotation curve, basically how are stars or gas sitting around the galaxy, you find that you need dark matter in order to explain this data set. The important thing is note the scales here. These scales are at of the order of tens of kiloparsec, few kiloparsec to tens of kiloparsec, this number, all right? In case that, again, your first year is still not very conversant, one, one parsec is three light years. Okay. So this is the proof of dark matter at the scales of kiloparsecs, tens of kiloparsecs. You go to a bigger length scale, say 100 kiloparsecs. Is there a proof? Yes. So this is an artist impression of the Milky Way galaxy. Uh, from If you say you get out of the Milky Way galaxy and take a picture from the side on, this is what the Milky Way galaxy will look like. This is the galactic center, this is the galactic bulge, this is the galactic disk. And there are these Magellanic clouds. So these are the satellite galaxies of the Milky Way. And there are other satellite galaxies. The motion of these satellite galaxies tells you that there is dark matter at the scales of hundreds of kiloparsecs. Right? You go even further. Uh, so this is a famous example of something called a bullet cluster. So a cluster is basically thousands of galaxies bound together. Uh, bullet cluster is when they collide. right? So dark matter passed right through them. This is a bluish region, and this is the gas. Right? So this we learn from lensing. This we learn from X-ray observations. So the, and this here, the, roughly the length scale is megaparsec, one megaparsec. So this is the proof that dark matter is there in one megaparsec. Note that I'm going a bit fast simply because each of this is a topic on its own. Right? And so what, what happens if you say you want to go even farther? Well, so this is the cosmic pie chart. right? So this tells you what fraction, what what makes up the universe of questions that I asked. Uh, so whatever you see around us makes up about 5% of the energy, energy density of the universe. This is the energy density. This is the dark matter density, 27%. Remaining is the dark energy, which is roughly 70%. And note that these numbers are known very precisely. These numbers are known to 1% accuracy. In fact, baryonic, uh, this number is known to less than 1% accuracy. Right? And this is the proof that dark matter is that gigaparsec length scale. So if you Again, if you make measurements of the universe from kiloparsec length scales to gigaparsec length scales, you'll always require something like dark matter to explain your observations. Right? But suppose you're a chemist, right? You say, well, I don't like it. Is there a theoretical proof that there is dark matter? Well, actually there is. So you can download something called the gadget code. Gadget is an n-body simulation, which simulates how the universe looks like. This, can, this you can run. Gadget 2, you can run in your laptop. Even if the laptop is not very good. My laptop is not very good. I can run it. Right, and then you can see what does the universe look like, right? And so this is not this is a, a, a more fancy simulation, but from there you realize in order to rip, in order to reproduce the observations of the universe, you require something like dark matter, right? Uh, collisionless, dissipationless fluid, right? So this is something from the illustrious simulation. This is one of these high fancy new simulations. It's actually, now now already outdated, but still, uh, the left hand side is uh, sorry, the left hand side is real, the right hand side is mock observations from the simulation. And you can see statistically there is no difference, right? And this is at the scales of gigaparsecs. So these are the observational proof. This is a theorist proof. If you're you a theorist, you say, I want to prove that one, this is your proof, all right? Okay, so these are the proofs we have been doing for the last roughly 100 years, right? But even then, we do not know the answer to the question, what is dark matter? Or what is dark matter made up, all right? Turns out that's a surprising difficult problem to solve. And also, I would argue, more interesting problem to solve. Uh, so in this talk, I'll be talking about one of the dark matter candidates, right? So you can ask, what can be the mass of the dark matter candidate, right? So turns out dark matter candidates can have a huge mass range from 10 power minus 22 EV. So these are particle physics lens scales, sorry, particle physics mass scales. So uh, an electron is half a MeV, half a mega electron volt. 511 keV, right? That's the electron mass. So this is 
orders and orders of magnitude smaller than the electron. Dark matter can be as light as that. And there's an astrophysical reason why this number, not something smaller than that. And whereas dark matter can also be very heavy, it can be macroscopic objects, like tens of solar masses. Right? So in this case, these are sort of black holes. And it can be anything, like right? you may have heard about WIMPs, there was a colloquium previously. There's light dark matter, there's ultra light dark matter, there's composite dark matter, and lots of different things. There's a wide range of mass scale. Right? There are plethora of solutions to the question, what is dark matter? But we do not know what is the solution. What is the solution that nature picked? And that is the thing that we want to answer. Right? And I think the way I would like to say is that this is something that we need to thoroughly test all well motivated candidates. Right? And I'll tell you, okay, this, this talk obviously I cannot tell you, but I can tell you in private after the talk, that there are ways to uh, probe this entire mass range. Right? Or they're taking, and people are still thinking about it, new ways to probe these things. Right? And especially, it is important to test regions of the parameter space of dark matter where it can make up the entire dark matter density. What does that mean? Suppose you take, uh, suppose you ask your particle physics friend that make up a wave model, particle physics model, and make sure that it can give rise to this 26% number density. Right? So this is a percentage you can convert it to, into a density. Uh, WIMPs can easily do it. Similarly, all of these things can do it. Right? So that's what I mean. So it's important to test all regions of parameter space where dark matter candidates can saturate the dark matter, cosmic dark matter density. Again, I'll tell you, there are ways to do it, especially at least for primordial black holes, also for others. Okay. So I'll give a brief introduction to what is primordial black hole. Talk about primordial black hole dark matter, just give you a, what is the minimal uh, property it must have in order to be primordial black hole dark matter. And then I'll tell you how to detect primordial black holes using Hawking radiation, right? I'll talk about various observables and then I'll conclude. Uh, if you have any questions during the talk, please feel free to stop me and ask. I'll be happy to chat during the talk. So what are primordial black holes? So probably many of you know what are black holes. So astrophysical black holes form when stars die. And now we know when black holes merge and things like that. So primordial black holes are exotic compact objects that are formed very early in the universe due to some, some kind of new physics, all right? In fact, making a primordial black hole is very easy. You open archive, you'll find there's at least one paper every day on how to do this. It's, no, it's literally very easy. And there's a reason. The reason is because, remember, uh, so I don't have this thing, uh, one solar mass black hole has a Schwarzschild radius of three kilometers, 2.7, right? So that's the length scale as well. Right? We do not know what the universe looks like in three kilometers. Right. Three kilometers here looks something, you go to some other place, it looks something different. That's the point. We do not know how the universe looks at these small length scales. So then you can basically do anything that you want. You can do it and produce primordial black holes. The reason you can do it is simply because you put enough matter or enough density in that small region. And once you have enough density, you collapse and form a black hole. That's it. That's a very basic idea. Of it, right? Okay, there's, there are lots of these things. Uh, the first paper of primordial black hole, as far as we know, was by Zendovich and Novikov in 1966. In fact, funnily, Hawking worked, worked on primordial black holes in 1970s, and he thought about primordial, sorry, and he thought about Hawking radiation while working on pri, uh, primordial black holes. Right? So the first mention of the fact that primordial black holes can be dark matter was in this paper by Chaplin, and then there are many others. It just goes on and on. Right? And uh, in fact, this is such an active field that I'll give you one slide on tell you how active the field is. There is a review every six months. Right. I have worked on many different black, uh, dark matter candidates. I've never seen any, any field like this. This is the latest review, right? 2310. I'm sure after six months, there'll be another review, right? Because the field is moving really, 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 very fast. That also means you can, it's a very interesting field. So why are primordial black holes interesting? So in, in some models of dark matter, so in some models of primordial black hole formation, in fact, in almost all models, but this is, this relationship is true for some models. I'll explain what this is. It can, you can connect the primordial black hole mass, MPBH, to the time of its formation. So this relation tells you that uh, in certain models of inflation, at when the universe age is 10 power minus 23 seconds, the primordial black hole mass, uh, the primordial black hole that is formed has a mass of 10 power 15 grams. Note that there are no other constraints, current constraints on the universe when the universe age is this time. The earliest we know anything about the universe currently is the big bang nucleus synthesis, which is about few seconds to three minutes, right? Before that, we don't know anything, right? So there are obviously constraints from CMB and inflation and things like that, but 
PBH is one of the ways to probe the universe at very, very uh, sm uh, small times. And, but that also means that even if primordial black hole is not dark matter, it is a unique way to probe, or one of the unique ways to probe the universe at very early lens, at very early times, right? Uh, so, so obviously, as I said, given that we don't know much about the universe at these early times, PBHs can have a wide range of masses, all right? This is one example. It can form even wide range of masses, right? So this is a big, big lens, 10 to the power minus 17, 10 to the power 5 solar masses or something like that, all right? And there are regions of parameter space, as, as I'll show you later, where it can form the entire dark matter density. All right. Uh, so just uh, some numbers. Uh, one solar mass, just to keep, keep in mind, is roughly 10 power 30 kilograms, and that is roughly 10 power 57 GeV. All right. And we'll come to some of these numbers back and forth. So just keep it, keep this in mind. That's solar mass. Yes. Sun. Yes. This is an M sun. Yes. To 10 power 5. So the entire region, uh, primordial black holes, can be either be 100 percent dark matter, or be a substantial po po portion of dark matter. So what I mean by substantial, something like 1%. That's already a substantial portion. Right? I'll come to what the constraints are. Okay? Yes? You say there are the nonlinear scales and scale of the power minus 32 pages. Yes. Uh, are you thinking of their head of uh, like uh, standard model particles or? Oh, actually, good. So, so the question is, what are PBH made? Well, actually, it doesn't matter. Once it forms a black hole, everything is just gone. So, so then again, if, if, if people have formed various scenarios of what, what they are made up of. But remember, a black hole as such is a very simple object. It has only three three things, mass, spin, and electric charge. It has nothing else. Yes. So what is the scenario? Yes. Space and scale is what? Yeah. I think it's um, in the current scenario, it's before this, but yes, the yes. question is about are we talking about like uh, density, like collapse of matter and density peaks and yes. fluctuates, density fluctuates and that's right. Yes, exactly. That is one of the ways to uh, uh, form it. In fact, that's one of the most popular ways to form it. Yeah, so you, you so think of it, I mean, you convert this roughly to a length scale. Go to the matter part. Yes. 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 No. If it happens, yeah. You know, if it happens before inflation, obviously it will be inflated around. Yes. So this obviously happening after inflation. All right. Again, this formula sort of depends on some of the models. Sorry, right? but, but the main point is that typically these are found very very early. That's the thing I'm trying to say. Yeah, has to come after inflation. Yes, yes, correct. Has to come after inflation. That's for sure. That that's the one simple constraint you can make. Okay. Uh, this and and then whatever is there in the universe. So for example, people have. I don't know, not, it's, it's not mentioned with these references that people think that uh, sometimes inflation uh, produces something and not just animal body, some, something and th those collapse, they have a substantial matter density. So these are scenarios called early matter domination. So typically in standard Big Bang cosmology, currently we are lambda dominated before this matter dominated and then this radiation. But you can also make a early matter domination and you can make a pH. Yeah. Exactly, yes. Koshik Dokto is somebody who's an expert on this, yes. Yes, yes. Modular things, yes. So, so, so there you take uh, those, whatever is early matter dominating matter and make a black hole, if, since they're dominating. In other cases, you can take the stand wall particles and make it, you can do anything you want, effectively, because there's just no constraint in these scenarios. And in fact, we are trying to probe these things. Is that clear? Yeah. So uh, also the other thing is, for example, as I said, black, primordial black holes can have a wide range of mass functions. By mass function, I mean the number of primordial black holes per unit mass, and they can have a wide range of spins. Right? As I said, black black holes have uh, typically PBHs cannot have a large electric charge simply because they will discharge over the age of the universe. I'll not talk about charged black holes here. Okay. Uh, so, okay. 
So let's talk about PPE start point, right? What is the, yes. Good, great. So the density contrast that is required to form a PBH is roughly one third and up, right? So, so, so that is orders of magnitude higher than what we probe in CMB, right? Yeah, but, but remember, CMB probed only a certain length scale, gigaparsec. And then above that, you can use large scale structure, Lyman alpha to probe maybe tens of megaparsec, megaparsec to really start fighting with people. But beyond, but below that, there is no constraint. The, yeah, so these are they, these require very high density contours, one third and above, like delta rho by rho. Yes, yes, that's very high. Yeah, that's orders of magnitude higher density. Yes, correct. Yeah, so typically, uh, this also requires the power spectrum to have a peak at certain length scales. Yes, very small density. Yes, okay. Uh, yes, so uh, let's talk of. But what passes primordial black holes can have. So I'll be talking about Hopping radiation extensively, but let me repeat a few things so it's easier. So what is Hopping radiation? Hopping radiation is a semi-classical process in which near the horizon of the black hole, a black hole has a horizon, that's a three kilometer number that I told you, one solar mass is three kilometers, and then it just scales linearly with that. A particle, so, so there is, because of high gravity, there is curved space-time gravity, space, you produce a particle-antiparticle pair and Hawking radiation, the calculation is basically the calculation of the probability of one of the particles to tunnel out from that near the event horizon to the to infinity. That's the calculation. All right. So there have been many ways to derive Hawking radiation, but I think this is the simplest way. It's a tunneling probability of particles created near the edge of the black holes and tunneling out to infinity. So you see, it's sort of like it, it has both uh, astrophysics and particle physics, right? Formation of particle in vacuum, curved space time, that's sort of like particle physics and asteroids. So you can do the calculation and you can also calculate what is the lifetime of a black hole due to Hawking radiation. Remember, these particles basically are take out mass from the black hole, right? And if this particles go away, yes. So will it be equal for natural antimatter? Yes, because it's just, just a gravitation thing. It depends on a few things, by the way. I will come to that. It depends on the mass of the particle, the spin of the particle, and things like the energy. But uh, for matter and antimatter, as far as we know, it's simple. This is for the simplest Hawking radiation scenario in GR. Assuming GR is correct. Uh, so in the, that, oh, that's a great question. Yes, good. So people, this is something people are currently trying to do using Hawking radiation to do matter antimatter asymmetry. Uh, and that's a talk on its own. To be honest, I have not worked on it. Uh, and there are ways to do it. And they, you can, what you basically do is using Hawking radiation, you produce a BSM particle, and then you do all this CP violation and all of these things, and then you use the Sakharov condition to get that, get, get the answer. Is that clear? But yeah, this is something people, people now, I mean, again, one, once a week there's a paper on how to do matter antimatter asymmetry with PBHs. Okay, so one thing you can calculate is what is the lifetime of a black hole in the presence of Hawking radiation? And this is for a non-spinning black hole, that means the black hole which is not spinning, this is the relationship. The lifetime of black hole is proportional to the skew of its mass. Right? Then you can do the actual calculation. So this is some time scale on the y-axis, initial mass of the black hole on the x-axis, and you can plot this relationship for spin zero. Say for example, a, this a, AI starts, so this is the initial spin of the black hole. If it's zero, you can plot this relationship and you get a line like this. This is very close and there's a reason why it's very close, right? And then here you can draw a horizontal line, which is the age of the universe, right? The age of the universe is roughly 10 giga years. We know that dark matter is present currently. So this, where this line and this line intersects, that tells you what is the minimum mass a primordial black hole can have in order to be dark matter. And that number is roughly 6 times 10 to 14 grams, right? This is incredibly small, by the way. Remember, one solar mass is 10 power 33 grams. This is Dr. Kruger, but forget that. This is very, very small. This is, in fact, atomic size smaller than the atom size black holes, right? Convert the three kilometer to something, right? But it is there. It can be there. In fact, the limits are even stronger. I'll come to that. That's basically the talk. If you have a non zero spin, right? So you can again do that. This relationship is, is not valid. There is a, depends on the spin, but it does not really change the mass that much. From six, it becomes eight or nine, depending on what is the spin. Right. So these are some of the spin parameters. This 
the maximum value of this can be one. Right? So that's come from GR again, energy conservation, speed of light, and all these things. Okay. So non-zero spin, we increase the mass. But the bottom line is that a PVH dark matter must have a mass of roughly say 10 power 15 grams at least to be dark matter, to be present at this point of the universe. Okay. Good. Uh, so what does the scenario look like? So this is the scenario. It's a very busy slide and simply because there are lots of constraints. So what is being plotted here? What is plotted here on the x-axis is the mass of primary black hole in solar masses. All right. So this is from this recent review. All right. And this is FTP. I don't know if it's clear or not in this in this screen. So this is the fraction of dark matter in the form of PVHs. All right. So this is the fraction, the maximum. Sorry. So the maximum value of the fraction can be one. And, and anything that you see shaded is ruled out. So how do you read this plot? Let's uh, read the plot like this. So 10 solar mass is this, right? And the limit is somewhere here, right? So that means if PVHs have a mass of 10 solar mass, and let's assume they have a single mass, that's just an assumption. So this whole plot assumes that the black hole mass function is a direct delta function. So reasonable assumption, you can uh, you can relax it and do other things. Anyway, so the way to read this plot is that when if the PVH mass is 10 solar mass, then the maximum density that can have is roughly 10% of the dark matter density of the universe. Anything above, anything that you see shaded is ruled out. And there are various different kinds of things. So you can see all of these constraints, right? I will talk of some of I will talk about the region here. Anyways, so and there are various ways to constrain these things, right? I will talk about Hopkins radiation, right, at low masses. You can use lensing to probe this. You can use dynamical effects. Again, I can explain what that is if you're interested. And you can also use accretion or, and other things to probe this dark matter kind of And typically, you'll realize that all of these things require completely different uh, knowledge to do, do this. Right? And that's why it's a very interesting thing. And that's why there are so many constraints in order to do it. But that also tells you, since there are so many constraints, there are also so many ways to discover PBH dark matter. Right? All of these things can be improved because of upcoming telescopes and you can discover PVH dark matter if it is there. If it's there here, so this region, something like Q times 10 power 17 grams to 10 power 22 grams, then it's 100% of dark matter. That's when you have basically hit the jackpot. Except that it's very, very, very difficult to probe this region. As far as you know, look. Yes, yes. Yes, I'll talk about one way to do it, which only tells us one order of magnitude, but the remaining thing is very difficult to do. Currently, I do not know of any realistic way to probe this thing. And you, nobody knows it as far as I know. A realistic way to prove. It. You can be a, be, be a bit optimistic and get some constraints here, but realistically, I don't think it can be done till now. Uh, but even in other things, for example, if you, I mean, I'll be happy if I can discover dark PV, dark matter at 10% cosmic density, all right? And I don't have high ambitions probably. But are this for things like macho? Yes, us? yes, good. So these are like, not able to rule out say ten solar. Uh, yeah, no, no, they, they, they are there. So, so the macho is uh, da, 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 da. macho is uh, yeah, all this eros, ogle, Icarus, yeah. all of this HSC, this hyper supreme cam, Kepler. So this thing. So so lensing goes from here to somewhere here, somewhere here. Yes. Yeah. So, so this is macho is. Uh, 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 the macho collaboration is somewhere here, by the way, somewhere here. Macho, Eros, uh, they don't show macho because Eros is a bit stronger. It, but these are names of various collaborations, right? Eros, Ogle. Yeah, Ogle is a telescope, but anyways, yeah. So these are, think of these are name of, names of various collaborations of telescopes. These I will explain later. This is CMD, uh, various kinds of assumptions you want to make. This is gravitational wave, CMB, CMB. Segway one, A, two. So these are observations of Dwarf galaxies, which can probe primordial black hole. Uh, these are X-ray binaries. This is Lyman alpha, uh, dynamic friction, first dwarf, uh, first clouds. Again, CMB, galactic disk. The fact that the galactic disk is there, it's not disrupted. And that's a constraint, right? If you have there's a disk, and if you keep on throwing big objects at it, it will break apart. That's a very basic thing, right? So that's the galactic disk. Wide binary. So these are where two stars are very wide apart. If suddenly PBH goes through it, the dynamics will be affected, right? So just again, but there are lots of details. It's not as simple as I'm making it, but there are lots of details. But this is the basic idea. All right. So as I said, in, in fact, this plot does not include all the constraints that we know of, simply because it, there are so many ways to prove this thing, or as I said, so many ways to discover it. 
And uh, uh, so this I said, we, we have different phenology at different master ranges. All right. So I will be a bit, I will only consider this range, the low mass range. All right. Since these are, I can give you sometime later. <laughs> right. So I'll be talking about PBH dark matter, low mass PBH dark matter. So what do I mean by low mass? What do I define? Masses between 10 power 15 grams and 10 power 18 grams. Convert that to solar mass is 10 power 19 solar mass to 10 power 15 solar mass. That's the, the, the those are the masses that I'll concentrate. And to tell you, even in this small mass range, only three orders of magnitude, there are numerous astrophysical probes in order to detect PBHs. In fact, I will not talk about all the probes. I'll just talk about some of them. Then many probes to probe PBH data. Right? And also, as I said, to discover PBH data. Oh, that's because that's the maximum you can go. I, mean, I have tried a lot to go. Yes, so the point is. No, 10 by 15 is the below. 10 by 18 is because if you suppose you get 10 by 19 grams, right? So, so there's an easy way to understand it. So the lifetime of the black hole goes as n cubed. If you increase it by one order of magnitude, the lifetime increases by three orders of magnitude, and your sensitivity goes down. And there is there is no currently no telescope which can probe say 10 by 19 grams for this way. So that's why it is maybe in future. In fact, 10 by 18 grams is something uh, which near future telescopes will will be able to probe. Currently, we can probe maybe a few times 10 plus 17 grams. So each small mass you get, there's a three or uh, I mean each decade gives you three uh, three orders of magnitude hit in the flux. And that's why it's why it's so difficult. Is that clear? Yes. Okay. Uh, so the PBHs. So as I said, let me repeat because I think it's useful. Hawking radiation is just the production of particles near a black hole and the calculation of the tunneling probability of one of the particles. One of them is absorbed to the, uh, to the, by the black hole and the other one is escapes to infinity. That's the tunneling probability, that, that, that's the calculation. So you can do that. This, this, this was first done by Hawking, right? It was actually technically also done by Zeldovich before that, right? So there's a, you can read this paper for the history of how Zeldovich did it. And then, but he didn't believe his results. And then Hawking, he did it for spinning black holes. And Hawking was shocked to do it, shocked to find that you can also do it for non-spinning methods. Right? But then, but Hawking does say that actually it was Zeldo which has done this earlier. They said, we don't know it. Anyways, so you can calculate the black hole thermodynamics, right? As I said, black holes are very simple objects, right? In some sense, but they're also the most complicated objects in some sense. If you know a black hole of mass, you can calculate its temperature, right? So a rough number to remember is that a 10 part 10 kilogram black hole has a, has a temperature of 1 GeV. All right, and it scales linearly like this. So this expression is true for non-spinning black holes. For spinning black holes, it becomes a bit more complicated, right? But as you can do this thing, one, one to one correspondence. For given a, given a mass, given a spin, given an electric charge, you can calculate a unique temperature of the black hole. And you can show that black holes, as I said, they evaporate, produce all kinds of particles, either standwall particles, or as I said, beyond standwall particles. And they have a spectrum like this. So this is the number of, sorry, the number of particles emitted with a spin S. So this is where the difference comes in for unit energy. This is the energy of the, of the particle emitted. This expression looks like this, right? It's a complicated expression. Uh, so let's see. So this gamma S is something called the dimension, dimensionless absorption probability. In fact, this is the thing that I'll show you in the next slide, which distinguishes Hawking radiation from a thermal radiation. Hawking radiation is not a purely thermal radiation. There is a small correction point. All right. So if you don't include this factor, then it's purely thermal because it only even depends on the temperature of the black hole. But this factor depends on the mass of the black hole, the spin of the black hole, and the charge of the black hole. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, no, this is depends on the. Yeah, this is. Yes. Yes, so yes. So there. Yeah, so let me repeat. So this S is the spin of the particle that is being emitted. In this gamma, there is a hidden, uh, so it's not written simply because it becomes too cumbersome. There is a spin of the black hole is also there. So this expression again, so just think of again, a black hole has mass, spin, charge. So obviously this expression depends on all of these things. Mass, spin, charge. Particle. And this S is the particle spin. And here this E is the total energy of the particle. So that has the particle mass inside it. All right. 
and this is a purely gravitational process, right? It does not matter what what are the uh, uh, charges of the particle in some sense. If, if, if since it will couple to gravity, it will be getting that's it. So how do you understand this? Uh, so this is the this is the plot. So here I have changed the notation slightly, and this this is simply to give credit to the authors, right? To, to the original authors. So what is being plotted on the x-axis is the mass of the black hole m times the total energy of the particle being emitted q. Right? And then these are fundamental constants, just ignore that. M times Q. Right? What is called as the y-axis is d2n, dq, dt. So the number of particles emitted per unit energy per unit time. In this notation, if you plot a black body spectrum, that looks like this. This is a black body spectrum, this length. Right? And if you take a non-spinning, uncharged black hole, and you calculate how many uh, I hope, pions, but pions are spin zero particles in some sense spin zero particles it emits, the spectrum looks something like this, S equal to zero. So that's the spin of the particle. You can calculate how many, uh, what is the spectrum of E plus and E minus, electrons, positrons, they have spin half, that's this. And you can calculate what is the spectrum of photons, that's this, right? So as you see, this is slightly different from the black body spectrum. It's not perfectly thermal. And this difference comes precisely from this gamma factor, this dimensionless absorption probability. Right. That's why it's not purely thermal. There's a slight difference. Right? There's also something else. Uh, so these are things I've said. For example, uh, going back to the previous slide, as I said, if you know the mass of the black hole, you know the temperature of the black hole. And it becomes even simpler. If you know the temperature of the black hole, it tells you where the emission will peak. Right? So you remember, so these are roughly a black body, and these roughly peak at certain energy scales, right? Certain energy scales. So if you know the temperature of the black hole, this, these equations tell you at what energies does the emission emission peak. So S equal to zero, spin zero particles. Uh, uh, the emission peaks at around about three times the temperature of the black hole, S half four times, and S one six times, roughly. So you see, that's how to get a length scale, right? So or to get an energy scale. Once you know the mass of the black hole, the spin of the black hole, it will tell you the temperature of the black hole, and immediately it will tell you from here, that at what energy will this emission be maximum, right? And then you can use your whatever astrophysical observations you have to search for those things. Is that clear? Sorry. Yeah. Please let me know if this, uh, this may be a bit, uh, I don't know, it's a bit advanced, to be honest, even for me. So please let me know if it's not clear. Okay, good. So let's try to now, given these things, all right, Let's try to see how do you discover PBHs, primary black hole dark matter, all right? So let's start from photons. We'll again go back to photons, but let's start from photons. So, so this will be Libets uh, from the isotropic diffuse gamma ray battery. So what is that? Let me explain. Uh, suppose you have a gamma ray telescope, say Fermi lab, and many of you have worked on the Fermi lab probably, and you plot the photon map from Fermi lab. Certain energy ranges. Uh, Fermi that roughly goes from one inch GeV can go lower to one inch GeV. You just plot the photon thing in the sky. This is what the map will look like. This is the galactic center. This is the galactic disk. This is the galactic bulge. So here, bright means lots of photons. Blue means very few photons. In fact, black there's a small black that means there's almost very very few photons. So this is what is effectively what is being plotted is the number of photons. Just think of it that way, right? It's actually technically the flux, but it doesn't matter. As, as I said, you can see the galactic disk. You can see signals, some of these uh, bright, effectively point objects, Orion molecular clouds, and then you also get the extragalactic gamma ray background, right? So what is the isotropic diffuse gamma ray background? So isotropic diffuse gamma ray background is you take this map, all right? Then you, first of all, subtract all known point sources, signals we know. Or I molecular cloud, we know. Similarly, we know many sources, you just subtract them. Then you subtract the contribution from the Milky Way. The contribution of the Milky Way is mostly this. Right? You subtract that. There are uh, templates, or, or in other words, there are, I'll show you in the next plot. There are energy spectrum, also morphology spectrum. How does it look in energy and space? You subtract that. And then you find out what is the uniform component that is left behind. That is the isotropic diffuse gamma ray background. Isotropic because it's uniform. It's diffuse because we do not know where the photons come from. 
right? It's not a point source, it's diffuse. The photons come from somewhere, right? Note that, uh, I don't know if I say this, anyway. So this diffuse, it sort of depends on which experiment you're looking at. If you have a better telescope, this diffuse will go down because we probably discover more point sources, right? Anyway, so from a given observation, you can measure the isotopic diffuse gamma ray background. And this is something which Fermi lab and also people outside Fermi lab have measured. Right? And this is what the spectrum looks like. So what is plotted on the x-axis is the energy of photons in MeV. And what is plotted on the y-axis is the E squared dm dB. Right? So the number of photons per unit energy and multiplied by E squared. Right? And it's a log log scale. This is the, these are the data points. And this is made up of these things. Right? One is the galactic diffuse. So that means photons that are coming from cosmic ray interactions with the galactic disk, for example, mostly galactic disk. That's these things, roughly, very roughly these things. All right. Next is the extragalactic diffuse. All right. So this is something that they have derived, right? Extragalactic diffuse. The cosmic ray background, again, cosmic rays doing all sorts of things, losing energy, inverse Compton, then strong things like that, and they're producing it. That's so in added colors, so it's probably this. Then there are sources, I told you Orion, there is that, all these things, sun, moon, they also, you know, that's this, right? You, you take these data points, subtract all of these things, what is remaining is the extragalactic diffuse, which is also the isotropic diffuse gamma ray background. Technically, the galax galaxy also has a component to it, right? Again, you have to be a bit careful how you define it. So, a little bit careful how you define it, all right? But one thing you realize is that above a GV, roughly the spectrum is a power law. In fact, it's one of the big astrophysics question. What makes up the isotropic diffuse gamma ray background? We do not know that. Probably blazers do it 30% maximum, but remaining we do not know. Right? So that means this, this component, extra diffuse. What 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 is this? Is it truly diffuse? Suppose there's an electron moving and this emits a photon. That's a truly diffuse photon. You'll never point the electron. But if it's some source, right, you are not able to see. Right, so that's uh, but with a better telescope you'll see it. So that's a uh, uh, that that's that as I said a better telescope will decrease that background. Right, we'll find the thing. So what is the source of this isotopic diffuse gamma ray background? We do not know. This is an open question. It's a very difficult question to solve. Also a very interesting question to solve. So conservatively you can do as follows. You can say well okay fine, this is the measurement. Right, any dark matter interaction cannot be give more photons than this. That's guaranteed. Anything. That's the simplest thing you can do. You just look at it and say, okay, it cannot give at, say, uh, this is 10 GV, it cannot give some here. Obviously, that's ruled out. Immediately, it's ruled out, just by eye. You can get a less model dependent result. You can also do a more fancy thing where you, you model all of these things and then find out what is the limit contribution of dark matter to it. Right? Note that you may have heard that dark matter does not interact by light. That statement is actually not correct. It does not interact by light with respect to the observations that we can make. All right. Uh, yeah, there, there can be unknown interaction, or the interactions, maybe the interactions are very weak. And it's, it can maybe interact with light. All right. Is this clear or is this super confusing? So when you say no interaction, you think in terms of the fine structure function because we are talking about electromagnetic interaction. Electron. Then yeah. The yes. Matter. Yes. Yes. Okay. So these are. It's an interesting and difficult question to solve in detail. So electromagnetic interactions probably it cannot. Yes. Although, yes. although technically people think that dark matter can have a fractional charge, and then it can interact by electromagnetic. It can be there. We, we do not know that. Again, there there can be well motivated scenarios from particle physics to do it. Uh, strong, it probably really does not do it. Weak interactions, that's a very interesting. Dark matter can interact by weak interactions. So they are you must have known there are four forces, right? Weak interaction, dark matter can interact by weak forces. Right? However, there are also regions of parameter space where we have ruled out that dark matter cannot interact by weak interactions. Like, for example, if I tell you a hundred GeV particle, suppose let's say dark matter is a hundred GeV particle, it interacts by weak interactions. That is ruled out for sure. But suppose you say, well, what about 100 TV particle? If it interacts with weakness, is that ruled out? No, answer is no. simply because we do not have the sensitivity to, to observe those of events. Ruled out means the cross-section is uh, lower than the circuit. 
I mean, it depends on the figure. Don't know whether it's no about it. No, no. Yeah, yeah. What? No. What I'm trying to say is no. It's like not just a cross section. So 100 TV particles with weak interactions are difficult to rule out simply because the number density is very low. So the typically way you do it is direct detection. You set up a going somewhere else. What is this? You set up a detector and you hope that dark matter will come and scatter with the detector. But there are very few 100 TV particles coming because we know the local density of dark matter. That is 0.3 GV per cubic centimeter. If the dark matter is heavier, there are less particles. So that's how it's, so you can make dark matter appreciably heavier and th then, your, then your weak scale is suddenly allowed. So that's where the thing is. If it's confusing to students, please catch me after the talk. I'll be happy to chat more. Okay, so let's see how to do PBH. As I said, let's do the simplest thing. This is the observation. This is the observation and we say PBH is Via Hawking radiation cannot produce more photons than that. That's it. Nothing more than that. It's surprising you get very strong constraints. So these are two plots from different authors. So what is plotted on the x-axis? Let's consider this. Is the mass of the dark matter candidate, PBH in grams. And this is the fraction of dark matter in the form of uh, PBHs. All right. And the limit. Uh, so th these are various kinds of limits with the positrons and uh, electrons and these things are something from Fermi data set. All right, let's just look at Fermi Dirac. Right, so Dirac is that means it's a Dirac delta function. This is the dn dm is a delta function, and it's, this is looking at the Fermi data set. Right, and you assume that it does not overshoot the background, o overshoot the measurement. That's it. It's actually a bit bit more complicated than that, but that's simple to understand. Anything above will be ruled out. Here it's ruled out. Anything above will be ruled out. All right. So these sigmas, these are different kinds of mass functions of dark matter, PBHs, you can do it. And these are things I'll talk about later. All right, let's do this. This is a bit simpler to understand. Again, if you just say that PBH photons do not overshoot the extragalactic background, that's this, right? This or the no AGN background. That means you say, I do not know what produces extragalactic, uh, I do not know what produces these photons, sorry. I do not know what produces these photons. I just say that PBHs cannot produce more than that. That's it. Simple thing. And then you get a limit like this. These two things. These are two different calculations that gave the similar limit. But then you say, no, no, actually, we know that this isotopic diffuse gamma ray background is produced by some particles, uh, sorry, some astrophysical objects, and let's model that. That gives you a stronger limit, right? Because again, some fraction of it is taken up, right? And then these are futuristic thing to know the background much better we can do it. This is the same thing. This is sorry, right? Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Again, this is the mass of the uh, PBH in, on the yeah. x-axis fraction. Yeah. Anything above this line is ruled out. So this is derived by assuming that the PBHs do not overshoot the measurement. Just the measurement. Diffuse government. Yes. And then you say. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that. That's the definition. No agent. We say we do not. We do not know how much agent contributes. We do not believe in those calculations. Let's say that PBH will not uh, overshoot that. That's it. This is roughly saying that well, we can do a double power of it, which is which is derived from agents, right? So then, uh, then it's only the error bars which PBH has to overshoot. So that's why it's a bit stronger. Kind of Modeling, yes. Yeah, known things. Yes. And this factor of 10, factor of 100, these are the futuristic thing, assuming that we will really know the diffuse gamma level much better. Is that clear? Okay, good. Uh, okay, so this is some, something from gamma ray background. Let's see what happens from positrons, galactic positrons. Uh, so this is a, another different astrophysical mystery. Uh, before that, let me talk about a small experiment, take just one slide. So it's called the integral satellite. This stands for International Gamma Ray Astrophysics Laboratory. This is a joint ESA NASA mission. Uh, it's one of the fantastic, well-run uh, telescopes in the what we have. It has two main telescopes: SPI, Spectrometer of Integral, which has this energy range and an extremely good energy resolution. And it also has IBIS, which has this energy, range, and that's a, it's a more of an imager. And it also has other instruments. So integral is running from late 1990s, and it has given some spectacular results. All right, of both astrophysics and particle physics. One of the spectacular results that Integral has really nailed down is something called the 511 kV gamma ray. Line. So what is that? Suppose you can measure gamma ray lines. 
right? Especially at five million kV, right? You take your instrument, point at the galactic center, or point at the whole sky. This is how the sky will look like. All right? This is only at five eleven kV, the whole sky. This is the galactic center, super bright. This is the galactic bulge, brightish. This is the galactic disk, quite bright. This is the extra galactic, completely dark, zero photons, nothing. This is something you say, well, okay, no, I don't believe it. Well, you can keep on doing this experiment. And people have been doing this experiment from 1972, 50 years plus. They see the same data set every time using different telescopes, different techniques, you get the same result. There's a bright 511 TV gamma, gamma ray line at the galactic center. There's a bulge emission, there's some disk emission, and nothing else. Absolutely nothing else. Where are the Oh, this, yes, yes. Sorry, yeah, this is it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. This is the yeah, this is the galactic uh, center, galactic bulb. Yeah, this is the galactic uh, longitude, this is the galactic latitude. All right. Is this clear? Okay, so the fact that this exists is not an anomaly, all right. This exists for 50 years and we still haven't been able to solve it. What is producing it? We don't know the answer. All right. This is a pure astrophysics question. What is producing it? We don't know the answer. So these are what the spectrum looks like in the bulge and the disk. All right. This is coming from Integral. All right. And Integral has made the best measurement of it. In fact, recently there's an experiment called COSI, a balloon-based experiment, which actually made a okay, again, comparable measurement. Okay, good. Uh, so what is it made up of? Just because I tell you 500 kV, you think, ah, okay, uh, that's the electron mass. Th that, that actually doesn't work. And this is where integral really came in. Uh, if you look at this plot very carefully, you realize this is the line, right? It's wide because of energy resolution. And you see the left shoulder is not the same as right shoulder. You see there's a bump, slight bump here, both here and here. And this is the thing that integral measured for the first time. So that means, we, we see 511 kV, that's the 511 kV of the energy, and this is the number counts, flux technically. We see the 511 kV, plus there are low energy photons, which are lower than these things. But there's nothing at higher energies, absolutely nothing. In, in this energy range, roughly in this energy, nothing. What does that tell you? Now, if you open quantum mechanics books, you can ask, what happens if I take a positron, positron and just leave it? Low energy positron, just leave it in the galactic bulge. Turns out it will lose energy as the positron propagates. It will lose energy. It will lose energy by Bremsstrahlung, uh, inverse Compton. It does anything it wants to do. And then something funny will happen. It will catch an electron and it will form a bound state. Either a parapositronium, the spins are opposite to each other, or an orthopositronium, the spins are aligned with each other. So it's just a spin up thing, the thing that you have learned in Griffith's quantum mechanics. All right. So this. Uh, it forms a thing, it stays for roughly 10 power 10 seconds, sorry, 10 power minus 10 seconds and it decays to two photons. And this stays for roughly 10 power minus 7 seconds and it decays to three photons. If it decays to two photons, produces a line, right, at the electron mass, which is also the positron mass. If it decays to three photons, it produces a continuum. Continuum means uh, it's a spectrum like this. Now you see, this is what integral effectively observed, right? If you change the normalization of these plots, Integral of the line and then a low energy photon, right? Let's go back. Sorry. Yeah, integral saw a line and a low energy photon. It doesn't, it, it's a bit broader simply because of energy resolution. And that finally nailed down that this is really due to low energy positron annihilation at the galactic bulge and disk, right? In fact, you can do even more. You can find out what is the fraction of positronium being formed. So it's almost one by the way. Right? Okay. And almost one. Yeah. These are something coming directly from integral. Before this, we did not know that. So that is before integral, if you said something crazy is just injecting 511 kV photons, we could not have ruled it out. Now we know no. It is definitely positrons being injected, not something weird things happening. Okay. Good. And then again, uh, measurement of gamma is high energy time, I said. If you leave a positron, it will inverse complete, it will and do crazy things it wants to do. The measurement of that tells you what is the injection energy of the positron. Like with what, what energy, that something, we don't know what that is. Maybe some things, many things are injecting positrons. Typically, they're injecting positrons at energies less than 3 MeV, roughly. All right. Anyways, good. Uh, so we know from this flux that something or many things are injecting positrons at the galactic bulge. With 10 power 43 per second. 
Per second, something is injecting tempa 43 low energy positrons at the galactic bunch. What? We don't know. When I say we don't know, that means obviously people have thought of many different solutions. We do not know which is the right solution. All right. In fact, recently there's a claim that maybe stars are doing it, super, which is technically supernova field. But even they cannot explain 100% of the parts, but that's some detail. So now you can ask, well, okay, something that I asked, can you actually probe PBHs using this? Obviously, it's not something I, I did for the first time. In fact, Martin Rees, the student, okay, okay, or okay, like, depending on which paper you look at, did it for the first time, even before I was born. All right. And uh, they were trying to do this, but I just did something in a more modern way. Okay. So how to do it? So as I said, very simple. You say that PBHs, so there's some equation, you don't have to worry about it. PBHs cannot inject more than 10 power 43 positrons per second as a galactic bunch. That's it. So, uh, so uh, from Hawking radiation. So th this will tell you, this is the dark matter density, this is the volume, so total amount of dark matter, PBH mass, the number of positrons, and then the fraction. If you just do this, you get a, a limit on what is FDM. Give, assuming some PBH mass, get limit on FDM. All right? It also depends on what is the dark matter density profile and other things. The limit is as follows, all right? What is plotted on the x-axis is the PBH mass, so on the y-axis is the fraction of dark matter in the form of PBHs. Uh, so these are the these lines that you see are the limits. So it sort of depends on what is your dark matter profile, whether it's NFW or isothermal, and it depends on how much the positrons propagate. So that means if you produce a positron, how much will it propagate before analyzing? So these are things we do not currently know, right? So these are the limits. No, no, no. This is thing is something else. This is not the positron thing. So this is uh, so there are two scenarios. One is positron is produced and it travels only for hundred parsecs before dying, uh, and the other is a positron is produced and it travels roughly one kiloparsec before dying. So this one point five kiloparsec is roughly the size of the bulge, or roughly the size of the bulge in five eleven k. Very roughly. So, so so here I'm assuming it's an isothermal NFW profile, and the positrons are only produced in the bulge. That means they only travel for. Uh, 100 parsecs, so that is not, not much thing. And here I just made it into a three instead of one kiloparsec, instead of 2.5 is. So that means they produce three kiloparsecs within the galactic center, either in FW or isothermal, and then they analyze. So that's the limit. So anything above is ruled out. And there are other limits from other cosmic rays, CMD, gamma rays. This is the limit I showed earlier. And these are cosmic rays. So this is uh, assuming that PBHs have this mass function. I think I'm probably turning it. So yes, you can change this, uh, but uh, it, it, this still uh, conclusion is true that galactic bulge positrons gives you one of the strongest constraints on it. Okay, I'll try to speed up a bit. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, what about galactic center photons? Right, so this I already said. They might talk about the isotopic diffuse gamma ray background. What about the galactic center photons? Like you look at the galactic center, you measure the photons, whatever. You can do the same thing. So let, let me just show you the results. Uh, the limit is this, right? Again, dark matter PBH mass on the x-axis, fraction of PBH in the form of dark matter in the y-axis. Uh, look at the 5 k So remember, I had four lines. Take the weakest line, that's this line. However, integral, which it can measure photons, there also has a measurement of photons. And from that, we get a limit like this. Anything above is doomed. Ignore this thing. Anything above is doomed. Right? Okay, you see, it's a super strong country, and we are sort of touching 10 plus 17 grams somewhere here, roughly. Okay? Okay, this is for monochromatic mass function, that means DN, DN is a delta function, and for non spinning black holes. You can generalize it. In fact, we have generalized it. So, if you generalize how much like the spin? So, then the point is if you take a spin, that's an additional free parameter. I'll show you in the next slide for future probe. And again, the mass function is an additional three parameter. So, so again, the plot changes a lot. Yes, log normal is something which uh, these inflation people talk about. But again, you can have anything. People have power law, things like that. Right? But the bottom line is that, yes, additional parameters. But the bottom line is that again, galaxy center positrons and photons give you some of the strongest constraints on PBH dark matter, low mass PBH dark matter. And you can constrain few times 10 plus 17 grams. Right. Obviously, our after our work, uh, many other people have done it. There is this paper by sorry, by a group from uh, UC Santa Cruz. They basically took uh, 
did our analysis using a different instrument called Comtel. Comtel was an old instrument from 1991 to 2000, and they got, get very strong constraints. Uh, there's something again, people re analyze the integral data, right? After our paper, they re analyze the integral data, and they get a constraint like this. This is this work, this work, and these are all the old results, that, some of the results I've shown you. All right, this is the again the flux energy flux you you do what makes up the flux right so inverse Compton nuclear lines positronium and all of these things unresolved sources you do a whole thing and you get a limit like this we now reach up to three or four times 10 power 17 grams very roughly and then this is i think one of the latest papers where they use measure observations of the milky way and large magellanic clouds to get some limits right again we reach roughly five times 10 power 17 grams very roughly now what? How do you probe even further? Uh, so like here, remember, so this is the thing, right? 5, 10, 10 power 17 grams roughly, and here it's up to 10 power 22 grams. It's completely empty. There are no, no constraints or no ways to probe it. So one of the ways which we probe, which we proposed is using near future gamma instruments. Uh, there's a reason near future gamma instruments are being built, just for being astrophysics, right? MEV telescopes, the last MEV telescope was Compton in 1990s. It was launched, launched in 1990s. After that, no MEV telescope has ever been launched. Right? People sort of consider it for me, but now people talk of the MEV gap. That means we do not know what is happening in the MEV telescopes region. Right? And there are many proposals. All right? Adept, Amigo, ESTGAM, Gecko, Pangu, Grams, many proposals, all of these things. Right? We do not, some of them, or at least one of them will definitely be funded. What is plotted here is the energy of photons and the effective area. The larger the effective area, the better it is. All right. So if you look at these color codings, you'll see all of these things cover the NEV range. All right. You see Fermi is this. Fermi is this. This line. And Egrid is uh, is this line, the thin line. These two thin lines. Egrid was an old experiment, old Fermi. Fermi is a current running. This is this thing. But you see, it's Fermi is very good at GeV energies. But Fermi is really not good at MEV energies. And all of these experiments have been proposed. These are different techniques, measurement techniques, and things like that. And to do what is uh, astrophysics and particle physics at MEV energies, we do not know that. As I said, some of them, at least one of them, will definitely be built by somebody. Uh, as I said, people have tried to see what kind of astrophysics you can do, and if people also see what kind of particle physics, especially BSM physics, beyond the standard physics, people can do. Something that we worked on. Is saying an instrument called Amigo. So that is something proposed by some people in NASA. What they can do? Which one? Amigo. Okay, I'm colorblind. I have to really look at very carefully. But Amigo, actually, no, no. Amigo has one of the best things. But see, the point here in this plot is that we do not know which one will be built. We we worked with Amigo simply because. Uh, one of our collaborators, Regina Caputo, uh, works on Amigo. That's it. So she gave some of these things. But, if, but I'll show you what other people have done. It be basically, the idea, so we basically proposed the idea. See, in principle, you can do this with all of these experiments. But then it becomes a sort of like a boring job. Right? You take one and show that if you have sensitivity, this I'll tell you, in this MEV range, and if it's high uh, effectively, you'll, you'll get a good limit. And then the rest are details, which are important details. But again, as I said, we did not want to do it. There's already too much work for this. Uh, yes, yes. uh, so, good, good. Can yes, great. So, actually, for me, GBM is something I am looking at. You can do it. Swift will probably not do it because Swift has a very narrow field of view. So, bigger field of view, more TV you are looking at. So, Swift will probably not work. Uh, but for me, GBM is something I'm looking at. For me, GBM is actually technically not that good, but just by looking at their uh, photon count and saying, I will not overshoot it. Can I get a better? I, I just don't know, but we are trying to think about it. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah. So, as I said, if you take one of these telescopes, Amigo is an example here, but you can do all the others. I'll give you some examples of other works. Well, you can say, suppose it looks at the galactic center, right? 10 degree or 10 degree, 5 degree plus 5 degree. What will be the uh, prop? What will be the range of PBH masses it can probe? Right. So again, this is the uh, the PBH mass on the x-axis, fraction of dark matter in the form of PBH on the y-axis. These are all the old things, like 511 KV I showed you, integral I showed you, Compton I told you. Right? This is what Amigo can do. 
for a non-spinning black hole. It almost reaches 10 power 18 grams. If it's highly spinning, it will go beyond 10 power 18 grams. This one monochromatic mass function. So this is the spin dependence. If, it, if you take a log normal mass distribution, there is a parameter called sigma. Again. This is something completely unknown. You can do anything with the sigma. Uh, so these are the old limits, Voyager, IGRV, 511 KV, Sim simply because others have not done it for the other ones, but it does not really matter. It's roughly in this range, and Amigo will do some, again, orders of magnitude better, at least one order of magnitude better than that. But as was asked, uh, why Amigo? Well, there's no reason for me. I mean, we just did it because we knew it. Other people knew, people in other experiments, they asked them what is the effective area. I mean, technically, we need a few more things which are not publicly available. That's why I think you can, uh, so this is a paper by different Caputo, Andrea Caputo et al, where they use something called the uh, POSI instrument, uh, observing the galactic center, this is the limit, this is the old integral limit, dot dot dot, right. You can also use something else called the XJS thesis, again, these are old observations, these are the new things, depending on what is the spin, you can do it, okay. But the bottom line is that if you have MEB telescopes, upcoming MEB telescopes, you can probe P-based dark matter in parameter space, which has never been able to probe otherwise. In other words, you can also discover them. Why? Well, the reason is very simple, as one of you pointed out. It has a larger effective area, so you can collect more photons. And also because uh, this is sensitive to, obviously, as you see in the effective area plot, it's more sensitive to sub-MEB photons, which actually is sensitive to higher mass PBHs. That's it. All right. Why then you ask why not something? Uh, I mean, we just do not know how to build a telescope which can probe PBH say at 10 per 20 grams. That's it. I mean, in principle, if you can build a better telescope with lower mass photons, you can do it. Except that the yeah, Hawking uh, radiation flux goes down. That's a different challenge. But in principle, it can run, but we just do not know how to do it. Okay. Uh, so there are other probes. I just skipped this. Something like 21 centimeter, you can use to probe it. DOT. Uh, dwarf gas heating you can probe it, you can do JD observations. You have to chat about this later. Uh, finally, I'll try to conclude. So I hope I'm able to convince you the dark matter, that what is dark matter? It's an interesting problem. In fact, we are at a unique juncture where we can solve this problem. PBH is a well-motivated dark matter candidate, right? In fact, it's one of the oldest dark matter candidates. I forgot to tell that. There are large groupings of parameter space where PBHs can make up the entire dark matter density or a substantial portion of it. As I told you, observation of low energy positrons in the galactic center can put a strong constraint of PBHs. Observation of galactic center photons can also put a strong constraint of PBHs. And near future telescopes like Amigo and also others can help you probe new parts of the parameter space. Again, there are other probes, there are various other probes, at least in this mass range. One thing I would like to stress, the last point, is it's important to probe this entire parameter space to as small a cosmic density as possible. That is, even if you find a very small Abundance of PBHs, that is something completely new physics. We do not, uh, we know nothing about it. So any, any discovery here will be a revolution thing. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for this awesome talk. Uh, yes. So my question is that uh, you are observing the gamma ray photons to constrain the Hawking radiation. Right? Yes. So why not the gamma ray? We are also good. observing in other band or oh, in other. Excellent. Band. Good. Good question. So I have also tried this. So if you look at this, if you are a bit sorry, if you look at this, a bit, you get a bit video. You say, oh, okay. So if we do sub MEB, we can probe higher masses PBHs. The problem is that remember tau goes as lifetime goes as n cubed. That's what kills you. So you can say, well, what, 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 how about optical telescope? Let me optical are much, much lower. So I'll probe much, much larger PBH masses, except that those telescopes are just not big enough. See, remember, there is a, when, you, when you're plotting it like this, FPBH, there is an upper limit of one. You can get a limit of FPBH equal to thousand, but that's a, you can't say anything. That doesn't tell you anything useful, right? So these are the, as far as I know, using Hawking these are the best you can do. Presumably, if you can build really large telescopes, I mean, hypothetically, if you build really large telescopes, you can probably do it. You can't always do it, but, yeah, but once you go to very, very heavy masses, the PBH temperature becomes less than the CMB temperature. Then it will not, it will, it will absorb more. So it becomes opposite top. 
but at least you can in principle you can go, get more but no current or near future telescopes can probe these beams at least using Hawking radiation it's very very difficult to do it hello yes for the talk yes. i was wondering if you could incorporate density in some way because oh, good. that could also use you could actually if you because PBH would not be like a cloud, you would have Correct. like point lensing effects. Yes. You could incorporate that. Yes. Effect. So that is, th those are everything here. Here it's very difficult to do lensing. As far as I know, I'm not an expert on lensing. Lensing actually does not work because it becomes so small. So lensing sort of depends on the mass of the lens. Sorry, here mass is the temperature, uh, mass is the radius. So the size of the lens and also the wavelength that you're using to do lensing. So here it's very, very difficult to do lensing. So here there are some proposals earlier on to use lensing of gamma ray bursts, probe it. But later people realized when this technique was proposed and they got a limit, it was fine. But later people realized for gamma ray bursts, the emit the region which is emitting the gamma rays has a finite size. This we have realized recently, and that has an effect on the lensing. Again, your limit goes above one, so you don't go it. So probably somewhere here, gamma ray burst, gamma ray burst lensing or gamma ray lensing probably can do it. But I think he's mostly asking about general lensing. Yeah, so general lensing is here. Yeah, general lensing, like I said, general lensing. So you see this lensing, right? Yeah. So general lensing. Some of the limits have been already done yeah. using lensing. Yes, so Eros, Ogle, Icarus, Kepler, HST. This, yeah, HST is hyper supreme cam. Kepler is Kepler telescope for exoplanets. Eros is a. Well, uh, lensing survey, Ogle is a telescope uh, in Chile, and Icarus is some type of optical telescope somewhere. Yeah, so these have done lensing, and these limits are somewhere here. It's very difficult to do lensing here because here the objects are really, really, very small. That's where the problem is. Oh, wow. Yeah, so you can convert, as I said, one solar mass is three kilometers. So this is roughly 10 power minus 15 kilometers. So that is it's smaller than an atom, probably. I'm doing the math correctly. But, anyways, yeah. So that's where the problem is. Other questions? So, thanks for the nice talk. So, mine there are two questions. First is that you showed a relation about mass and the time by 10 to the power minus 10 to the power minus 10 to the power Yes, yes. 10 to the power minus 10 to the power Yeah, yes. Yes. So, is this mass PVH term a relation with all the holes irrespective of the impression model? No. This is, as I said, this for some of the impression models. But typically, it's almost always true that no matter what model you look at, PVH masses, PVH is formed at very, very early times, around which we have no, uh, we have no observations. Oh, I mean, the, the reason that was the, is the relating test required or plays a role in this holding? It, it, I mean, typically, yes. Because reheating is required to populate, if you believe in reheating, it is required to populate the cosmos, and then certain regions have large uh, large density, and that is required. Yeah. So this is typically after reheating, obviously. So the second one is the general that uh, now we have so many models of dark matter. Yes. So is it a possibility of this thing that dark matter you need not to be only a single candidate or more yes. like? Yeah. Yeah. Obviously. I mean. I mean yeah, yeah, think of standard model, right? There's no one standard model particle. Yeah, so it's possible that dark matter is uh, anywhere here or some, with some fraction. That makes life more, even more interesting, right? So, yeah, but yeah, again, we have to. So typically people, when do these uh, searches, people assume there's only one single dark matter candidate for simplicity. And, and actually, suppose there's a fraction, right? You take all my limits and you just scale it proportionately. So that's just a normal scaling people don't think about too much. But people know that it can be done. Yeah, so I have two questions. So first of all is regarding the monochromatic mass function yes. to get up. So I was wondering, so is that just a simplified assumption for yeah. computational assumption physical? No, no, it, it, it's it, so there are some models which give a monochromatic mass function. Uh, it's also a simplifying assumption. The calculations become simpler, but as I as I showed you in the Amigo plots, people have done it for extended mass functions also. So and the another thing was wondering that you know in the plot that you showed only regarding the sensitivity of different method lensing and dynamic effects and uh, etc. Yes. 
So okay. at the at the like there is a very high must be there is there is also admission if it's high must be yes. so how how is how does that 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 actually yes. work? So that works in two ways. So let's first think of accretion at, at early universe. PBHs are obviously there. They'll accrete matter. They'll heat up CMB. And you realize, probably you know, CMB is a very good calorimeter. You can't randomly inject energy to CMB. It will go crazy, right? So that's one limit. That is uh, I, I, the CMB distortion. And also the CMB, these two things, right? These two things, really, if you want, these two things are effectively, uh, how does high energy particles affect photons? Effectively, that's all this PS, whatever, CCL, and all these things, right? That's one thing. The other thing is accretion now. So that plot is, that figure is not there. So that will look like bright point sources of radio and x rays, right? So people have worked on it. And if you're interested, I can tell you it's not that interesting. Again, there are some limits somewhere here. A slightly less than one solar mass to just keep simple. Yeah. So people have looked. So these are current. Uh, so these are current age, current epoch constraints. So we see bright point, anomalously large number of bright point sources. Remember, if these are, if primordial black holes are present, they are much more numerous than ordinary black holes. So this is a calculation I have done. Just take, I mean, it's actually very simple, right? You can just take this, uh, take this number, assume PBHs and astronomical black holes are the same ones. Just simply, you will find there's all, we are already off by a factor of five immediately. And then the mass function, not all baryonic matter is from black holes and all of these things tell you PBHs are much more numerous. So you, you would have seen many more numerous point source of X-rays and radios that we don't see. So that gives you a constraint on from accretion. Again, there are controversies because we don't really know how accretion works very well, but we can get some limits. Another question? Yeah. Uh, Yeah, I had a couple of questions. My email is there at the end of the slide, so you can email okay, me. Okay, so I have two questions. Yes. One is essentially, and this is at a much naive and yes, yes. sort of direct level, but essentially what we are saying is we are at the solar system. Yes. If we go a few kiloparsec away, yes. then there are many, many tens of 17 gram black holes. Even the solar system probably we have to see the numbers. But the solar system. So then uh, we should see we should see like micro lensing. Yeah, yeah. So so that, yeah. So that's exactly this is right. So let's do one by one. So this let's talk of the HSC limit, right? This HSC is the this thing. Yeah. Hypersubsidence. Yeah. This is looking at a galactic bulge. So it starts at galactic bulge, and then you're looking through the dark matter there, and you look at anomalous bright brightening of stars. So yeah. So so so, so that is this limit. Eros is, I think, looking at the Magellanic clouds. Uh, Ogle is also, I think, looking at the Magellanic clouds. Yeah. So people look at various different things, lots of stars. The way you did do lensing, and right. and these are sort of the limits you get. Kepler is somewhere here. Kepler is also. Okay. Um, so at that kind of so so what does that mean? That means that there could be, I mean, say, if I say 10 to the power minus 7 solar mass. Yes. So that fraction is less than, more than less than, say, 10 percent, roughly. Yeah. roughly 10, less than even 1 percent. Yeah, probably. Yeah, these are logs, but yeah, these are yeah, 1 percent. 1 percent can be from, because otherwise you will yes. expect it to Otherwise, in fact, technically, what I, okay. Let me tell you something even more controversial. So, Ogle, uh, yeah, Ogle has actually found Anomalous lensing events. That's some you see here. There's a like this somewhere here, yeah. uh, which is roughly planet mass, and that can be explained by PBHs, but it can also be explained by free floating planets. Right, like brown dwarf. Yes. Yeah. Uh, again, we do not know. So they, that is one hint of PBH somewhere here, somewhere here. So. Okay. Yeah. Again, that is looking at the galactic bulge and things like that. Yeah. Oops. So not more than that fraction, but that part is open because of this uh, whole. Uh, it's not possible. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. I mean, one one of the reasons just one second. One of the reasons is because if I remember correctly, if you go to lower masses, uh, the lensing anomalous brightness becomes longer, and then you have to look at the object for more than ten years, and that doesn't work. 
I mean, you can't look at an object for 10 years because it's already at a bright, bright, bright phase. I think that's one of the limits of, of this if I remember. Okay. And the other question I had was. Yeah, let's hold on. Yes. I was reading a couple of days back that uh, there are some talk about nine planets and yes. some gravitational effects. Correct. So I was reading that, yes. that then there are certain models which contribute or engage as the nine planets. Yes. There yes. are yes. talk about being, yes. some being inside the solar system. Yes. 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 So if you believe in the ninth, ninth planet, we do not know if that is true or not. Then there is at least some models which say that that is PBH. So these are roughly five times the Earth mass. Uh, and then you can show what is the probability of it being captured by the solar system. It's a reasonable probability. But then, okay, we don't know whether that exists or not, first of all. And then whether it's a planet or a PBH, it's extremely difficult to do it unless you do direct imaging. But yeah, so that is actually something here. So that, that is something there too. Yes, question. Okay, so Remember yeah. So, yeah. Think of it indirectly. Yeah, you can think of it indirectly. No, uh, Direct direction. Probably not. Yeah, basically because the number density is very low. The number density is very low. That's it. I mean, well, we know that in the in the yeah point three GV there. Yeah. So, so we can do it right now, right? Say 0.3 GV per cubic centimeter in the solar system. As I said, one solar mass is 10 power 57 GV. So a cubic centimeter has 10 power minus 58. So, so we have to go to 10 power 58 cubic centimeter to get one PBH of one solar mass. And then you can linearly scale it here. Yeah, it's a very, very small. So, so there's almost no PBHs passing through. So that's why you see, that's why when you do lensing, you have to look at either the magnetic clouds or the galactic bulge. Effectively, you look at lots of stars, to get some limits. That's a yes, that's a yeah, another way to say it is this. Yes, correct. So whatever is proving is very small mass dark matter can be yes, yes, yes. So that we can have a substantial number of them uh passing through here. No, you can say well, if we are lucky someone goes to it. People have people have thought of, but that becomes a bit too much sometimes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. oh, good. Good, good. Yes. So, so the question is LIGO has directed, LIGO, Volvo, Kagra collaboration has directed GWs. Are those coming from PBHs? The most current answer is no. Uh, we think they are not coming from PBHs. Uh, and I think this is the limit. GW, LB2. You can do some of the, yeah, this is the limit. Uh, we think they are not coming from PBHs uh, because of various reasons. Ah, good. You can also do it. So LIGO has also observed, well, LIGO is not observed. LIGO has upper limits on stochastic gravitational waves. You can again uh, calculate the probability that it comes from PBHs. The answer is no. Then there's nanograv or the pulsar timing array. Uh, that's in a bit of a weird situation in the sense that technically, if you believe in the result, new physics has a higher Bayesian probability than standard model physics, or that means supermassive black hole models, but well, new physics has more parameters. So that's always the stuff. Yeah. Probably not. Yeah. I, don't know. I mean, there are, I mean, for first time, there are many, many models. Probably you can do it. It requires very heavy PBHs, but again, they cannot be 100% of dark matter for sure. Yeah. Maybe some small fraction, probably they can do it. You tweak the model a bit. <laughs> okay. Yes. This means sort of coming from uh, positron and positronium. Uh, uh, Positrons forming a bound state with electron, electron, positronium yeah. and then, yeah. yes. Yes. Okay, that's the mother, right? That's the yes. mother. Yes, 500 degrees. So, since this slide is out, out till now, yes. so essentially, again, coming back to my question, yes. so let's say the magenta line that goes from and some go the so part, uh, okay, <laughs> so, so this one, so this line, yes, that's going, so yes. from 10 to the power minus 6 to something, yes, yes, so that is telling me that let's say more than, so this is point 0.1, yes. 
So let's say uh, point uh, zero one seven. So something like uh, more than one percent. Yes. Uh, of the dark matter yes. can be in the form primordial of black hole of this mass. Yes. Anything right. that is white can be dark. That's right. Yes. But that sounds uh, difficult. I mean, hard to believe because then I mean this will produce. No. I mean, I understand that there is a lot of. So, see, the point is that there is no. Yeah. No, no. So that, that means, that means that no, no. See, the point is that. Point is that there is no observations which can, for example, there is no observation which can rule out this parameters currently. Now you can say maybe theoretically you can do it. That's fine. But is there an observation? The answer is no. If it's no, see, I am sort of doing it from like a. Right. This is not from coming from model. This is coming from a signature. Is there signature? The answer is no. That, that's what it is. Okay. Please ask. What are the So the question may be C. No, no, uh, from your slide, I can see that uh, the mass range of uh, primordial black hole can be the order of 10 solar mass. Yes. But the astronomical uh, black holes have also can have the mass uh, order of 10 solar mass. So why can you specifically saying that okay, primordial black holes uh, is the candidate for dark matter? All other black holes can also have the well, other black again, okay, other black holes you can calculate the their energy density of the universe. They don't make up the number. That's it. This five, uh, sorry, this twenty six percent somewhere here, right? So you can take the black hole mass function, integrate it. You you say can, does it make up twenty six twenty seven percent of the energy density of the universe? The answer is no. This is something I've done once. You can do this. Take some people have measured that. Here. They are experts here <laughs> in the audience. Just take just do an integral. That's it. Take Mathematica Python integral. You will not get that. Number. So, so, I think, I think, I think, I think, there, that would be as well. You don't know. Yes. Yes. No, there is actually, okay. So, since you ask, yeah, since you ask, there is actually a way to distinguish it. You can ask, suppose PBH have the exact same mass function of astrophysical black holes. How do I distinguish it? There's actually a way to do it. And the answer is actually very simple. Astrophysical black holes form from star death. So they will roughly follow the stellar um, uh, stellar uh, star, form star formation rate, star formation rate, right? Roughly uh, with a delay. PBH is a dark matter. They will go as one of one plus Z cube. So if we ever find the dark matter so PBH signature or black hole signature Z equal to forty, that's it. Uh, you can probably enjoy the rest of your life <laughs> to confirm it. <laughs> Yes. So if I understand correctly, it is not known that what are the source of those yes. Right. Yes, yes, yes. And then you might propose it. There's a proposal that suppose they're coming from the Hawking radius. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. I'm actually not I'm not explaining it. I'm just see, actually technically it cannot be uh, it cannot be due to PBH dark matter because we know dark matter is spherically symmetric, NFW profile. This does not look like a spherical symmetric. There, there is something in the in the disk. So the entire component of five eleven kV line cannot be from PVH dark matter. What we what I was saying is actually even simpler. I said this observation tells you something is injecting ten power forty three positrons per second. Let me just be very conservative and say PVH cannot inject more than ten power forty three per second, and then you get a limit on that. Now you can do a you can say well okay now we know more things this that yeah but. Yes. How much PBH can be allowed? Exactly. Yeah. Yes, yes. Oh, that, okay. that, 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 yeah, yeah. I I don't have any favorite candidate to be honest. I I I have to discover any of them to be honest. <laughs> yeah, but as I say, technically, we yeah, there is this paper Seeger et al. where they say that probably supernova one is supernova one is produce aluminum twenty six, which produces a posit a positron. They think they can explain some part of it. They can explain, but it's actually a very difficult problem to solve because it's very difficult to get the bulge to disk ratio, the morphology, and things like that. It's very difficult to get. Yeah, yeah. 
Yes, yes. Effectively, everything is there on the table. We do not know which one. Maybe it's a, uh, a mixture of this. Yes, sir. Systematic is very hard. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. That's yes. right. Yes. Yes. No, no, no. That is there. AMS has AMS has confirmed it, but that is at very high energies. That cannot come from uh, that cannot come from thin regions. Yeah, GB and above. In fact, the latest result is AMS zero two has confirmed it up to a T. Yeah. Okay. So, there are all that question. I actually have a comment, but before that, I have a question. It's just a completely different question, and I, I know you're running out of time. No, that's, that's, that's something that needs to be asked in this. Uh, so, you mentioned wise uh, binaries as one of the constraints yes, for yes. speech, but then on the other side, now Gaia has detected many wise yes, binaries. Yes, yes. There are a couple of papers. Yes, now. I know. <laughs> it says that the wise binaries in the low acceleration limit. Yes, yes. Here is not working. Correct. And there is also a counter argument of that. Yeah, that's right. The there counter is paper, there is a counter yes. paper, now there is a third paper. Yes. So, uh, so effectively about, you know, modified Newton. Yes, so yes. What's your, do you have any comments on that? No. I have not worked on it. <laughs> no, no, I have not worked on it. But, uh, right. One thing is the people who have said that it's not MOND are people who have worked on MOND for the entire life. That's uh, Pavel Kupa and somebody. Pavel Kupa's Pupa saying this is not Pavel Pupa in the real Bonik. So they are worked on the module. They are saying. Bonikator has said that it's not working. It's yes. not, in a sense, it said that it is not yes. Bonikator. Yes, yes. So that sort of my prior is saying. Is... Okay, let me tell you something. Okay, let me tell you something I told in my job talk. Why that matter? I, I say this is my answer. You look at these observations. If you look at astrophysics at all different length scales, they tell you something is missing. In, forms of gravitational potential. Either I can do it by mass or I can do it by changing the potential uh, that is mon. Dark matter is the most economical solution. I put dark matter, all of these problems are solved at one shot. If I put non-dark matter, I cannot solve some idea. That doesn't mean that, okay. Oh, yeah, I cannot. So that doesn't mean that mon is wrong. I mean, I have worked on dark matter. I would love to prove Einstein wrong. Just being recorded over. Oh, okay. But it just, it's, dark matter is the most economical solution. That's it. That's what I, I think. So, again, okay. that's just what it. Okay, if there are no further questions, then I, uh, I will end with a comment, which is, so, so this is like a, this is a, the ending of the story that I started to say at the beginning, in the introduction. So, when Ronald uh, contacted us in 2017 to give a talk, we also said, yes, yes, of course, uh, please come and, uh, so we, yeah, yeah, so we decided a date and then Ronald came and gave the talk. But incidentally, Estimai was not present. And actually, the user also gave the talk. Yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> so uh, Estimai was not present. And also, since we did not uh, know Ronald before that day, so we were not sure how the talk will be, exactly what the topic of the talk will be, etc. So then Ronald came, came and gave a wonderful talk. In fact, the, the introduction to why dark matter is needed at different scales and how, which is what we just said that, why this is sort of a unique solution to all of these problems. That's one of the best introductions to dark matter that I ever had. And, and I've probably had about 100 dark matter so, uh, so then I went home and SPM asked me that, how was the talk? Because again, we had no idea. So I said, oh, this was a very good talk. We really missed it. So since then, we really wanted Ronald to come back and give a talk so that SMM can also relate <laughs> to it. So I'm very happy that finally this happened today. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah but conference is not matter. Conference is not matter. No, no, conference talk and colloquial talk. Yeah, we Okay. I don't know. Thank you very much. It's a great My pleasure. Yes, it was the last last colloquium come of this year. On January 3rd, the laboratory faculty from Ayuta will come and give a talk on the graphic updates. And then we will talk on the same Yeah, then regularly from January, it will be again regularly.